thank you, thank you all for coming here tonight, and thank you all to people in Google land who will be watching this later. Um, so Alex ruined my opening because I was like going to give this list to everybody. I was like, microbes have already solved the world. I was like, it's obvious. And, and, and I had this whole case study uh, as to why that was that was true. In addition to you know penicillin and, and other antibiotics, I was going to you know mention particularly from my area of interest, which is filamentous fungi. Uh, you know, things like Taxol, which has now been identified actually as a you know, fungus that is living inside the plant that is producing these sorts of medicines, as well as our statin drugs, which also uh, often originate from fungi, filamentous fungi. So um, just, you know, huge, uh, we wouldn't, uh, many of us would not be here uh, already, uh, in addition to all of the gigantic industries that, uh, again, like produce our vitamins and enzymes and, and stuff like that. Um, I also feel like a bit of a cheater because, like, I'm talking about macro, you know, the macro world, and uh, so it's well, 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 macro organisms save the world. Uh, so I'd say yes, uh, macro organisms will save the world. Um, I, I guess I should go back. Hi, my name is Phil Ross. I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of MicroWorks, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the things that we're doing um, with filamentous fungi and at the microbial level. Um, so it will relate to that. And and as to what we're doing to create materials. Um, this one did not start from really any idealistic uh, standpoint uh, to solve any problems, but was much more of a philosophical inquiry into the nature of how things look, <coughs> and, uh, how things look in nature as well, um, and an understanding of our aesthetic criteria of the things we, you know, are, that are in our world and how we qualify those and recognize those. Um, and that dovetailed with my uh, many decades long um, sort of involvement in wild, wild mushrooms, their identification, their culturing, and their domestication. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of what we do. Um, so one of the problems that we're trying to address through filamentous fungi is to create new types of hides. Um, there really will be no replacement for leather. Uh, the market projections for this go on forever, increasing as human populations do. So. There really isn't this idea of a drop in so much, I think, for with these types of materials, particularly with these very mature industries, but more so to create other types of options that in addition to animal de derived hides, but and in addition to petroleum derived hides, that hides that can be grown vegetally or actually fung fungally. Um, so I think um, an educated audience here, you probably heard about the devastating effect of cattle farming in terms of the resources that it draws from the planet, the residual toxins, the effects on human livelihood and health, uh, and also how this is often uh, economically uh, quite uh, unequal in terms of who, who, carry, who carries the burden of the cost ultimately, uh, in terms of, again, like how, how it affects local resources. Um, so somewhat accidentally and also by course, uh, we've come up with a number of different materials that can be grown from filamentous fungi. Uh, this grew out of my art practice uh, and from a 30-year inquiry into uh, this sort of esoteric field. Um, so we figured out a way to use um, nature and the powers of just ambient growth to create things that can be used uh, in the stead of, le of leather. So to get down to the microbial level, um, this is what mycelium looks like. I think I actually mixed up the order. I sort of show free growing mycelium right here as it starts to sprout off of whatever it's starting to eat. It has these long, it's extending cells which are in a search-like pattern uh, until they actually come in contact with another, with one another. And then when they come in contact with one another, they're actually cross, uh, create an, you know, an orthogonal type of bond with one another and they actually form a right-angled clamp. They actually physically will bond to each other um, mechanically and then they'll infill that space around them uh, with an, you know, sort of an extracellular type of complex which cement things together. So they can form these very thin layers uh, which we then take and we manipulate much as one would uh, make a milfoil or a croissant, you know, as we know, by taking many thin layers of, of bread dough and, you know, molding them in certain ways to come up with a very different configuration than you would get with your sourdough uh, and to come up with different types of physical, physical orientations of the base polymers. Um, and we can create large sheet stocks from this way with um, down to the cellular resolution in terms of how these, uh, you know, um, these cells grow and are able to emulate structures of keratin, of collagen uh, at that level. So we are looking at the structures of leather and then trying to grow our mycelium into leather-like organizations. Um, 
As opposed to animal hides, we have no upward scale limit. We are already producing 27 square foot pieces of this after four months of intensive R&D in the subject. So we feel that pretty soon we'll be at whale size or you know whatever the the measure <laughs> the measure is beyond that. We're sort of like we're at that horsepower thing. We're like, well, what is it? A 20 hide? You know, a 20 cow? Uh, you know, we're like, <laughs> we don't even know how to quite put the, the measurement onto that. And there's um, other things that we can do that um, you can't do with animals in terms of both ethics and possibilities of what the organism is capable of doing as it grows. Um, we can engineer it as it grows. It's durable, so we can create different shear uh, strengths. We can create different um, insulation qualities to it, uh, durability, um, uh, ev <laughs> evanescence. Um, and different types of skin quality, so we can actually grow it into different configurations. We can also do a lot of post-processing. Um, so we can sort of have n-dimensional printing or whatever you want to call it, n-dimensional growth. As opposed to 3D printing, you can have something that is just sort of self-ablative and can be changed as it's actually coming into being. Uh, you can kind of put a molecule one place and then put it somewhere else if you want to. So you, know, you, don't, have to <laughs> you don't have to make your, your decision until the end. Um, uh, and we can do this much more rapidly than with animals. We can do this in two weeks as opposed to the typical three years. Uh, and uh, we use agricultural waste as our input. We do this all pretty much at room temperature. Uh, and so we are, you know, we are taking a, a sort of a, a, a landfill material out of circulation. Uh, we create a valuable material and then our waste product is valued by organic farms as an addition to, to their compost. Um, so I think we saw uh, from Dr. Dyson earlier, this kind of closed loop uh, cycle. So we follow a similar suit that you can start to grow things. You can um, you know, use your mycelium to transform that agricultural waste. You can create consumer products and then those things can be reintroduced right into the earth and are actually beneficial to the environment as opposed to all the outcomes of, of animal hides. Um, we see ourselves able to scale very rapidly um, into this area. So because we're using very mature industries from food production for cons consumable mushrooms, uh, it's pretty low tech uh, in comparison to most other types of ways of producing hides. Um, oh, and I guess we're back at the beginning or at the end uh, here <laughs> of, uh, of describing this all. So um, uh, what else could I tell you? So again, like to kind of um, the larger philosophical thing, um, you know, I think it was at the beginning here describing that, yes, there's every, you know, like your body is just covered with microorganisms all the time. It's really kind of a remarkable thing. Like if you ever get into culturing things, it seems like a lot of you in the room here have had experience in laboratories or some such like that. But of the diversity of things that are just living on, on your body, uh, one of the types of applications that we're looking for into apparel is to make, um, you know, probiotic footwear that's actually working with the flora and fauna of your foot in, in a way that's beneficial to them. You know, you have, you have these obligate organisms that are there that you need for the health of your foot, and then we often enclose these in a sock inside of a nylon container and maybe inside of other things, and you have this kind of contained unit that is letting whatever ambient biota has happened to get in there in this perfect containment area that's often very sweaty for a 12-hour period. So as opposed to looking at as you need to put chemicals into that that are going to kill those things along with all the beneficial organisms that are there for you, you could actually grow an insole and have it react to that biology of your foot in a positive way so that you're going to have a better, you know, a better piece of apparel. Um, these organisms are considered to be food safe. Uh, their food quality, and uh, they have a long history of topical applications in traditional Chinese medicine. So there's an awesome case history going back two millennia of <laughs> their safety. Uh, so this is part of the reason why we chose the organism that we're working with. Um, there's a whole you know, um, gazillion other uh, filamentous fungi that we're interested in. Um, so we feel that first we're going to show the utility of the conversion rates and the abilities of this organism to create something that's very valuable for industry. And from there, really, um, macroscopic fungi have no end uh, of application uh, on Mars, on Earth, and uh, you know, all over the universe. Thank you. <laughs>